Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Fragrantica Talks where I'm joined once again by Adam Forziate and I'm Nicola Thomas. And today we're going to be talking about new releases. Now over the summer, um, a lot of chatter in the fragrance community was around how dull, um, uninspiring perhaps, and perhaps even thin on the ground some of the new releases coming out were. But I think that some brands have been teasing us and they've saved some absolute corkers for the late summer and early autumn. So last week, Adam and I were talking about some of the new things we'd managed to smell and we thought, what a fantastic topic for a Fragrantica Talks episode because there's some really, really exciting stuff coming through that I can't wait to talk to you about. Um, There's obviously such a lot coming through at the moment that we haven't been able to smell everything. So, Adam, do you want to take us through the things that we haven't been able to smell but which are worth putting on our um, viewers and listeners' radar? Yeah, absolutely. So we we have some exciting announcements from uh, some heavy hitting uh, niche and indie brands specifically. Um, I do want to just take a quick moment to to note that, you know, Nicola and I, we kind of specialize in the niche and indie scene. That's sort of our bread and butter. There are many um, areas of the website, Fragrantica, where you can go to learn about more designer releases and certainly many great authors on our site that, uh, you know, write about that regularly. Um, this is sort of our area of expertise, but I do encourage people who are maybe like niche and indie curious to to stay with us. And maybe those who maybe haven't dipped their toes into the, the vast and murky waters of the niche and indie scene yet uh, to stay with us too, because there's, like, like we said, there's some really interesting stuff coming out. Uh, and we do have on the docket for today, some discussion of, uh, of a designer uh, perfume. So stay tuned for that, please. But uh, new and niche and indie upcoming that we haven't gotten our noses on just yet. Uh, Andy Towers' uh, new perfume called Golestan, uh, it's sort of described by the perfumer himself as sort of a floral balm. Um, it, reading some of the notes, it's sort of the typical uh, floral uh, Andy Tower fare. Kind of sounds like it could be some sort of floral shipra. I'm not really sure um, if I'm allowed to call it that because it doesn't technically list oak moss in the notes list. However, uh, knowing Andy Tower's style, uh, many of his perfumes seem to be at least somewhat inspired by classical shipras. Uh, so I think maybe we're, we're in store for something along those lines, but with maybe patchouli instead of oak moss, or very at the very least a uh, floral amber perfume. Um, Etat Libre de Orange dropped uh, frustration with vanilla, cinnamon, rum, vetiver, chestnut, wood, and cumin in the notes list. And that sounds pretty uh, delightful for the upcoming cooler season in this uh, part of the, the world anyway. Um, Wilhelm's To My Father just dropped. Um, this has notes of ambrette and juniper, whiskey, and leather. Uh, and an interesting note of Cabrueva, Cabrueva wood, which I have not uh, smelled before. Uh, Bogle has released an EDT and complementary EDP uh, called 10 and 20, respectively. That seems to be a pretty standard Bogle fare. He has a very uh, memorable style. It looks like this is going to be kind of a floral fougere inspiration. Uh, and then we've also learned that Parfums de Cita is just about to launch something new uh, later this month in November uh, that we'll have some more details on shortly. Have you heard anything, Nicola, from uh, any of the brands that you follow about upcoming releases or? recent new ones that you haven't smelled no, yet? No, I think you've, you've covered all the ones that, um, that I, you know, I, I know about as well. Um, in terms of ones I haven't smelled, ones I have smelled, I've got a lovely desk full. Yeah, I'm really curious to hear about some of the ones that you have smelled. Um, and so why don't you start us off with a couple? I know you have a few more than okay. I do, so I'm kind of curious to know where you're going to start us off with. So I'm going to start you off with... I don't know how to think about this one as a re-release or a new release. It sort of sits somewhere between the two. So it's Shangri-La by Hiram Green. Um, for people who are new to Hiram, he uh, does all natural perfumery. But one of his um, sort of ethoses is to confound expectations of natural perfumery. So his scents are really quite large and characterful. Um, you know, they're, they're not quiet muddy scents which you know there's a kind of impression that natural perfumery, perfumery can be like that at times they're very well structured he seems to rely on structure a lot does Hiram 
Now, Shangri-La was, I think, his second fragrance he released about 10 years ago. Um, and I've actually just done an interview with him, which is going to be upcoming on the site very soon or may even be published by the time this goes out. So that will you know, cover this in more detail. But Shangri-La didn't sell very well when he was a very small brand. So um, he discontinued it. Fast forward, you know, best part of 10 years, and he's decided to bring it back, but he's tweaked it. So he reckons that um, people who know the original won't be able to tell a lot of difference between the two. He said this one is softer um, and more kind of gentle. Um, but it, it's really very nice. It, I think this would really appeal to people who've got that um, leaning towards slightly vintage feel fragrances. It starts off really fruity and juicy and really bright, and then it mellows and becomes much kind of um, like peachier um, and softer and more tender. And then the spices creep in before like a vetiver and oak moss really ground it. So it's in, it is in a you know classical sheeper structure, which I think he relies on you know a lot in the composition to really make it clear. Um, it is it's punchy. I mean the the sort of way I would describe it is, or the, the words I would pick to describe it are, you know, kind of um, glamorous and elegant. Um, it's that sort of feel. It's it's somebody that's very well groomed, somebody that's very presented. Um, and I, I kind of feel like, I think, what is it, 1917 Sheepers came in, something like that? that you know, don't quote me on that. I might be wrong. Um, but it feels to me like it has a sort of, 40s film starlet vibe um and it's a really very wearable fragrance that will take you from day to evening very nicely um great for people who likes the original shangri-la that he's brought it back in this form um you know with not too many um changes because i know you know some brands when they do reformulate they they come under a lot of fire for for doing that so it's nice that he's kept it very similar to the original. Personally, I can't speak to how similar it is myself because I, I think I did smell the original Shang Shangri-La, but I don't remember it well enough to say. Um, but yeah, it's um, that's dropped, I think, last week or this week. So it's it's very new um, and it's very nice. And yeah, there'll be an article out about it very soon. Awesome, awesome. That's a, That sounds really interesting. I do like uh, what I've smelled from Haram Green quite a bit. I think he's a very interesting uh, perfumer and uh, that one seems particularly interesting to me. How how powdery would you say it goes? You know I how how I feel about powdery. Hmm. I don't think it goes that powdery. I'm just gonna spray it again so I can smell it live and think about powderiness. Um start it definitely starts with more aldehydic than powdery. Okay, that's great. That's great for me. I mean, I can handle that, but um, you know how I feel about that particular texture and fragrance. But no, I, I'm curious about this one. Uh, there, he's released a few things lately that I've been uh, eager to get my nose on. I know he dropped that uh, that lavender focused uh, fragrance not too long ago. Uh, I forget the name of it. I think it was perhaps Acadia, if I'm not mistaken. Acadia, yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, there is a little bit of powderiness in this, but. I I don't think it's overbearing. Okay, well that's that's reassuring to me. Uh, mm -hmm. How how about another one? I, I know you have a few more than I do, so I'm curious to yeah. know what else you have on the docket here. Next one, um, Abu Dhabi, um, new from uh, Galavant. Um, I I'm really impressed with Galavant. I think they're a really interesting brand. Um, Nick, um, who who owns and operates the brand, is is a really nice bloke. Um, the uh, the initial fragrances they came out, came out with were quite um subtle uh, not that i think that is a um a bad thing you know they were quite subtle quite intimate perfumes to wear i feel like as the brand's going on they're getting a little bit louder i found naples a little bit louder than um some of the ones that they'd done before um, and this again, you know, it's not, you know, there's absolutely no way you would call this an obnoxious scent, but it's just a little bit, it's like the volume's getting gradually turned up on them. So this is hot, dry, spicy, um, and obviously is inspired by Abu Dhabi. So the notes are cypress and pink pepper, 
pristine white robes, um, leather gloves, saffron, geranium and oris. Thankfully, I don't get much geranium from it. When you spray it, it is dazzlingly crisp and it does give you that. It, it's amazing, really. It's, it's almost magical, the sense of bright white light that it gives you. Um, really crisp, really bright, blazing sunshine, but it's almost like you're a little bit divorced from the heat. It's the dazzle that the perfume gives you rather than that sort of warmth. Um, and then, so there's that kind of crispness with how it starts. And then the leather creeps in and just really softens it, um, just really mellows everything out. And, it, yeah, it's really interesting. I um, I think it's incredibly wearable. Um, I... The person I would sort of imagine wearing this would be um, a kind of a city gent going to the office, really crisp shirt with this, you know, sprayed over the top, very well groomed, you know, very um, sort of starched and put together and, um, you know, nice cufflinks, nice briefcase. Very, you know, one of those people, that everything's in the in the right place and they never look crumpled. Um, that's who I imagine immediately wearing this. Um but I think it it's another evolution of the brand. It takes it, you know, it takes their line forward again. I think it's a yeah, it's a it's a really good perfume and it's definitely worth getting your nose on if that sounds like your sort of thing. It's another uh brand that I, I I've always wanted to become a little bit more familiar with, but I just haven't had the opportunity yet. So I'll be uh keeping a lookout for them uh, in in future visits to well stocked perfume stores. Um now that one in particular sounds great because I think there's a, a huge harmony between uh, materials like clary sage, pink pepper, or cypress. They seem like things that kind of bounce off of each other and have a huge energy about them. So it's not surprising to hear you uh, describe this as like blinding white light. That sounds really interesting. Mm. Yeah. And one of the things that's nice about Gallivant is that they they do small bottles, so they're not screamingly expensive. You know, I think I think it's 30 ml as standard. Um, I think they may do a larger size now as well of some of their best sellers, but um, just that kind of standard 30 mil just means that they're, you know, it's still niche perfumery, so it's not cheap as chips, but it is a little bit more affordable and very portable. You know, I don't necessarily think we all need 100 mil bottles of everything. Um, that's, that's something I really like about the portability of a 30 mil that I can chuck it in my bag and take it to work. So if a scent is a little bit quieter, I can reapply it um, during the day or certainly if when I finish work and I'm maybe heading out to the pub for an after work drink, something like that. But yeah, it's a nice it's a nice scent. So I figure I'll probably I'll dive into one of mine, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, please do. so. Uh, this is something I'm going to write a full review of, and I'm actually going to interview uh, the perfumer, uh, Josh Meyer from Imaginary Authors. Uh, they just dropped a very a brand new one called In Love With Everything, and I have the box and a bottle right here to show you because I feel as though the um, the art on the box is sort of illustrative of, of what you can expect from the smell. Um, not exactly my normal kind of, like, this isn't this isn't, it's one of those scents where you, you might not personally connect with like some of the aesthetic, but you find it so fun and so um, successful in its illustration of that aesthetic that you're just like, oh, I, I can get with this. This is great. Yeah. Um, so it's called In Love With Everything and it, it I'll, 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 I'll describe it this way. Uh, Sun Drunk from Imaginary Authors was this really fun citrus, pulpy, orange soda kind of smell uh, that was very summery, but uh, the fun quality of Sun Drunk was that it was like conjuring all these low-key, relaxed, fun emotions. Emotions of uh, the end of a summer day when you're kind of coming down from the rush of what you did that day and you're enjoying small moments. That was sort of like the vibe that I got from uh, one of their earlier releases called Sun Drunk that I thought was a particularly fun release. This is a very fun release too, uh, but it, it's fun in a very high energy way. Uh, the roller skates coming out of like the boom box. Yeah, very 80s, but also very indicative of what kind of energetic scent this is. Um, it's very in the now and very like, 
eye-opening in terms of its its scent. It's uh, got this electric quality, energetic quality that I, I really enjoy. Um, that's also kind of bolstered by the fact that at one point in the middle of the wear from this, you get kind of a hairspray smell. Uh, and some people are not going to like that. You know, this isn't something that I might have chosen for myself based purely on my usual taste, but it's something that I've been really enjoying discovering, uh, not only for its ability to push me comfortably away from my uh, bubble of taste, but it's also sort of like a situation where uh, it's just so fun and kind of funny uh, in, in not, not in an ironic way, not in a bad way, just sort of like a, a, in an approachable, warm, friendly kind of way that I, I really enjoy it. And I think the perfumer made a really uh, smart decision here because his his whole thing was to create this like big fruit cocktail smell, raspberry, like electric raspberry, bright raspberry note at the top, citrus pulp, coconut palm sugar, um, tropical punch. I mean, like huge, big, sweet notes like that that I would not normally gravitate towards. But he made this really smart decision. The base of this is really just a good sandalwood accord. Mm fascinating i i'm not sure i haven't asked him yet if he used any real sandalwood in it or not or not uh, i'm guessing probably not because i think that would actually go against and weigh down the composition uh in this case what you get uh once all those big energetic notes dry down is this just a really peaceful nice high quality sandalwood accord that you know Listen, it's very basic. Once the dry down hits, it's it's sort of a sweetened sandalwood accord, and and that's the end of its life on skin. It's not one of those uh, perfumes where the end is like this big orchestra of notes. It's not like that. It's it's much more modern in its in its minimalism. But the top is certainly not minimalistic. Let me be clear. Um, but what you get is just like a really nice sandalwood accord at at the base of it, and that's something that I think deserves praise in and of itself. Uh, sandalwood is a core element of perfumery. And if you can make something that's convincingly good sandalwoody, I think you're going to have success in the market, especially in the niche market, but uh, outside of the niche market as well. So I just want to just praise it for that alone. But I also want to praise it for the fact that it balances all of these sweet elements in a way that isn't too sweet for my taste. And that's saying a lot because I'm very sensitive to sweet notes. So I have a, I'm having a really good time with it. I think anybody who is not averse to those kinds of notes will have a blast with it. And I think that anybody who might be more uh, hesitant to uh, sniff it based on the notes that I listed, I would say give it a quick sample if if anything else I said intrigues you about it. It's a really fun perfume. Uh, I would say that um, something that characterizes imaginary authors is that you have like a schism in in the house's releases where you have like those fun like kind of like not childlike because it's a very adult house i think um and the themes are are often adultish but uh there's like a a youthfulness about many of their perfumes a fun quality like i've been saying fun a million times um but then there's like half of them that are very wistful and almost like woe begotten and like uh a little bit more brooding you know uh, and then there's like a couple perfumes that are sort of in the middle and they toe the line between that. I think Cape Heartache is sort of in the middle from, from imaginary authors. Whereas I think Sun Drunk or Indeed in Love With Everything is sort of in the fun side. And then you have scents like Cobra and Canary that are very like uh, meditative and, mm. and, 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 and uh, they're not miserable to wear. They're really nice to wear, but they're, you know, they're, they're darker scents. So it, it's really interesting to see what he does whenever he launches something new, because um, he has this identity to his work that I, I think is is admirable. And uh, I'm really just, again, I'm having a blast with this perfume. So I'm excited to interview him and to, to get a full review up on the site. And I think people will have a good time with this. Yeah, I think that sounds absolutely fantastic. I can't wait to smell that one. Um I, I'm interested about the Raspberry Accord as well. How you know how true to life is that? Do you think? Well, uh, you know, I said neon raspberry before, and I, I think that might might be a clue as to how um, lifelike it is. So, you the thing about this perfume is that you do get from the very top uh, all of its elements kind of successfully clearly coming through in their own given um, 
ratio. So when you smell just from the bottle and just, just after you apply it, you definitely get a huge wallop of sandalwood underneath. Uh, but, um, and that, that kind of, like I said, it's sort of uh, flat lines in a peaceful, good quality way. Um, the raspberry itself and all those other like accessory notes that are like high energy sweet, um, they're all kind of in a somewhat of a balance where the raspberry is prominent above them uh, and then everything else is in sort of a, a plateau among themselves. So you can you can pick out the raspberry, it's there, you can identify it as raspberry, uh, but you have some, some supporting players that add dimension and distract in a good way, add dimension to the raspberry accord. Um, I would say that you wouldn't expect a lot you know, it, it's sort of interesting to describe it as like a lifelike accord. It's not a lifelike accord. It's like this, like this uh, heightened neon pushed over the max uh, uh, raspberry accord. Uh, all that being said, there's enough in it so that you can identify it as strawberry over other red fruits, which I do think is a huge accomplishment. Um, fruit accords mm. are really difficult uh, and mm. they're even more difficult to make lifelike, but the magic of this one is that he's I don't I don't know of any like raspberry fragrances. I don't know of a fragrance that's ever successfully communicated that um, without it kind of skewing too candy like or without it skewing too like strawberry or just general geranial based berry. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. it's an accomplishment. You will be able to tell that it's raspberry but you should also expect some other uh, competing accords settled right underneath it to kind of lift it up and, and to add some contrast. Mm. Yeah, I'm definitely excited to smell it. It sounds fantastic. And, um, you know, there's such a strong house in terms of both concept, art direction and fragrance. You know, they, they seem to be that sort of triple threat of clever ideas, clever perfumery, cleverly presented, which I, I just think is you know, even the sense from them that I'm not so keen on, I, f I still find them fascinating because they are like this experiment in pushing something in a certain direction, which is, yeah, it's really cool. So glad to see them dropping a new one for sure. So Nicola, can you run us through an, uh, another couple of yours? Mm. Yeah. So next I'm going to take you to an under the radar, a little, little bit under the radar, um, British brand called Angela Flanders. They're, look at this like really sweet little bottle. Um, just really nice, simple presentation. Now, people that know about these are going to be like, oh, they're not under the radar at all. But they they don't sort of push themselves to the fore. Um, so they're a little bit, they're a bit of a quieter brand, I think. Now, their new release is Leather Rosa, um, which has notes of raspberry apricot, damask rose, rose de mai, agar wood, leather and tobacco. It really rests on two central pillars, a really nice, pliable, soft leather accord and rose. And the two work together. Now, there are other things sort of swirling around the edges. There's a bit of this sort of tobacco-iness. Um, there's a little bit of a stemminess to the uh, green stemminess to the rose. Um, but the real space of the fragrance is leather and rose, which already makes it a success in my mind, because if you call something leather rosa and you don't deliver either leather or rose, I think you're you sort of you're on a hiding to nothing. But this delivers on both. It's not weird, it's not out there, it's not the stranger end of niche perfumery. You're not gonna smell it and think, wow, I've never smelled anything, you know, remotely similar similar to that before. But it has this really timeless quality now i've got a theory that you could get a bottle of this now and in 10 20 years time it will still smell relevant and it will still smell appropriate and it won't smell dated um but i also think that you could have worn that 50 or 100 years ago and it would have smelled relevant and undated then um and i really like there's something i find quite um haunting almost about the way that the brand and this fragrance floats through or it feels like it floats through historical eras and time periods and I think if you were a time traveler 
I think you would probably wear leather roaster because wherever you ended up next, it would feel of its time. Um, and yeah, it's just a very good example of a leather rose scent. Like I say, it's not weird. Um, it just does what it says on the tin really well. So yeah, and it's just, yeah, beautifully classical. I have never heard a fragrance described quite like that. So I think, <laughs> isn't there that that fragrance uh, writing and communication award? I think you deserve one of the one of those for <laughs> just that uh, that that monologue. Um, I don't think anything more needs to be said about it. I'm hooked. I don't think I would normally like those pairings of notes put together, but if you're gonna speak about it like that, I'm at least a little curious to sample. I could I could see you wearing this actually. Um, you know, yeah, it's not necessarily what I would automatically reach for but there's there's a tenderness to it which I, th I find really interesting you know there is this sort of I mean and, and that's what they were aiming for is this kind of clash of what is might be considered stereotypically masculine notes with the stereotypically feminine notes but actually what results is this kind of tenderness and this petaliness and this su suppleness somehow which is really pleasant um so yeah a great one to wear if you, you know, going up to the city for the day, if you want to, you know, be like fairly relaxed, but also a little bit on your, on your game. So yeah, it's really, it's really good. Really just solid fragrance. So what is, uh, do you have another uh, fragrance to share then? Yeah, let's go to, I'm saving one because I'm so excited about it. So I'm going to come to that last. So next, I'm going to go to the one that I'm... Well, yeah, this, the, the, these last three that I've got, I'm excited about all of them. So talking of artwork, you know, and you showed the box for um, In Love With Everything, um, look at the gorgeous box. This is Sarah Baker's gold spot. I just love Whoa. that beautiful, um, absolutely gorgeous... It looks almost like an engraving. Um, so Gold Spot is, to my mind, well, I loved Ludo. I didn't expect to love Ludo, which is a sort of cherry chocolate oud. You know, we've talked before, not huge oud wearer. Um, but there was something about the sort of playfulness of um, Ludo that Gold Spot picks up on and takes in a slightly more floral direction so the oud heart um is the same in both fragrances it's the same perfume it's chris maurice in both um but here there is a definite gourmand side to it and the way i like to think of it is that gold spot and ludo are sisters um and gold spots the slightly older you know raven haired sister and no, sorry, Ludo's the slightly older raven-haired sister, and then Goldspot comes along as the flaxen-haired younger sister, who you might think is all sweet and playful at first, but actually she's got a bit of a, you know, a bit of a racy side too. Um, you know, as the name suggests, it's very golden smelling. It's very radiant. Um, it projects like an absolute monster. It lasts forever. Um, one of the things that it called to mind when I was thinking about it a lot is. If you imagine, you know, like a kind of old statue like that you might find in some sort of, you know, like a, a relic of some sort that at one point had gilding all over it, but pilgrims have touched it for so many years that it's rubbed the gilding off. So now you just get the wood, the old deep wood with kind of flecks of gilding left. That's what this reminds me of. Or on the other hand, I sort of sometimes think about it as like a really rich chocolatey dessert um, set on a wooden platter with like a bit of gold gilding for decoration on top. It's um, it's a huge perfume. It's a hugely characterful perfume. Um, but it has like these soft, fun, you know, rich, playful edges. Um it's it's really interesting, and I think you know anybody who liked Ludo. I think most people who liked Ludo will like Gold Spot. It's a good one. No, that sounds absolutely beautiful, and it strikes me that something like that um, might appeal well to the type of uh, perfume buyer who's really concerned about how a perfume performs. Um, mm. I, I I just I feel as though I, I've read or some comments or, or just sort of seen like the the. 
the type of personality online who um, is a perfume lover, really loves when things are, you know, high projection, wants a huge woody kick to their perfumes, uh, might be interested in 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 this in this fragrance. It sounds absolutely, like. yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. And people who, you know, so I think there's a there's a few people. There's that person that you described. There's people who like oud, um, because I think there's no doubt that it's a good, it it's a good um conjuring of oud, um, I believe it's a an oud tincture that the perfumer prepares for himself. But again, you know, don't quote me on that. Um, and so I think yeah, oud lovers will love it. Gourmand lovers will love it, yeah. And people who are sort of wanting to get into oud, but they don't want that whole skanky fecal barnyardy oud. They sort of want the the woody kick of oud without it going too funky. I think they'll they'll really appreciate it too. So, can I interject then with? uh my second my second perfume mm-hmm. and my final perfume i might add um also i, I apologize to our viewers i feel like two-faced with this light this extreme de- difference in light going on it's like a flip a coin you get niche right like okay well we'll, we'll, we'll try to work with it um okay we have my, my second and, and final of this discussion is something that i've spent a, a good bit of time with because i'm also going to include it and a little bit of writing uh, upcoming for 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 Grantica. Um, this time, it's it's more of a, a part of a roundup of, of tea scents that that I've been working on for for a while. Um, I was going to publish it like last week, but then I, I heard about a Providence perfume company uh, fragrance called uh, Lapsang Lover, I believe, uh, that that's coming out now, and I just figured I, I had to sample that for the for the roundup. Uh, but no, this perfume has made the uh, the the cut for the roundup of tea scents because I think that um, this fragrance called Arquiste Indigo Smoke is actually quite a good cho- choice for those who really want to smell black tea in perfume. Uh, and I say that, and I, I think any tea perfume lover might might be tempted to kind of you know raise their hackles and say, wait, wait a second, there's plenty of examples of black tea in fragrance, and I would argue. Eh, because when you think about it, many of the, the black tea fragrances are also thoroughly spiced, you know, with with, with spices or chai-like qualities, um, and that, or they have like a, a milky kind of quality, you know. They're, they're it's a literal interpretation of of a, a cup of tea with sweetener and milk and or other flavorings. Uh, rare is it that you get an example of a perfume that you know illustrates a tea in its purest form and. I wouldn't quite say purist to describe uh, this tea accord because there are certainly other players involved, but I find that they're, you know, on the sidelines cheering it on. Uh, uh, it would not be a Fragrantica Talks episode at this point without an appearance from Finnegan. He's decided to step aside. Well, you know, too bad, Finnegan. You get one more second in the spotlight. Good. Okay, that's for our our our, um, our cat loving and pet loving uh viewers out there who have commented hey when are Win- Finnegan and, Win- and Winnie coming back uh well, Winnie's in the background right Winnie the slug she's yep. being a slug today <laughs> yeah we love to see it uh okay so our keys to indigo smoke uh it is an example to me of, of black tea in somewhat more of a pure form there's not a lot of like or not really any like milkiness or excessive sweetness at all um, the, the sweetness is pretty light in, in this perfume. Uh, it is a fragrance that, you know, technically they list Lapsang Souchong, actually the smoked black tea as a, uh, as a note in this. And they also in the base list, uh, Mate, uh, what I, what I think happened there is they might have used a combination of some green, longer lasting green materials, and maybe like a coumarin, uh, to create a Mate like effect because Mate, on its own when it's extracted for perfumery has a very coumarinic hay-like quality. Um, or they could have used Mate Absolute. I wouldn't put it past Arquiste to use uh, something like that in their materials list. But uh, to be honest with you, I think Mate is, is sort of a much, much more subtle player in this. I think it's more about the, the black tea, the smoked black tea. Now, I think of it as a proper black tea leaf smell rather than a Lapsang Souchong smell because Lapsang has a very, very aggressively smoky scent to it. And I don't think that this is something that 
people who are smoke averse need to avoid automatically. Uh, you need to be able to tolerate a little bit of smokiness to enjoy this perfume, but I would not say that it's something you have to go running from the hill for the hills from uh, if you are nervous about smoky notes. I, I would say it's much more friendly than that. Um, it's sort of got this, like I said, there's a coumarinic quality in, in the base that makes it kind of handsome and um, somewhat masculine leaning, although I could see anybody wearing this uh, as anybody should if they desire it. Um, I would say that... Uh, you know, there's like that kind of um, bitter quality that oversteeped black tea has. Um, you're a Brit, you know, uh, you know that quality. Very well, I'm sure. <laughs> I do, uh, yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, okay. Another thing that I really enjoy about this, uh, the smoky elements that are used are used so sparingly that it kind of gives this smoothed over texture of like, being in a uh, very fancy, fancy kind of restaurant, not one that necessarily allows smoking in, but the type of restaurant that um, might pump in scent as like some fancy hotels do, that kind of scale is what we're talking about, like where there's a thickness in the, uh, in the air and the atmosphere of the space. There's a thickness to this too, almost like an oily quality. I talk a lot about that thick oily quality. It's a quality I really tend to love in, in perfume. Um, there are some fruity notes in this to kind of play against the bitterness. Um, there's not really uh, a very present note of, of, of fruit in here, but the, the little fruity quality that is there leans apricot-like to me. Um, but again, it kind of avoids that very, um, I think at this point, cliched quality about tea perfumes where it has to skew really sweet and, and, and creamy or really sweet and fruity to balance off that bitter uh, tea. Not in this not in this case. In this case, they, they embrace some of tea's bitterness. And I think that that's a really wise move because there's plenty of sweetness from those coumarinic hay-like qualities in the base that that kind of poke through and, and balance out the bitter uh, in a really pleasing way. So if you are interested in the idea of a black tea scent that really embraces those uh, tannic wine-like black tea qualities, um, I would really check out uh, Indigo Smoke from Marquise. It's a beautiful perfume and, and one that I will um, be uh, hankering to wear again as soon as possible. Mm. Uh, again, I'm really excited about your choices for this episode. I think they both sound fantastic. And in some respects, you make this sound like almost the opposite to um, In Love With Everything. It you know, it seems a little bit moodier, a little bit melancholia, melancholia, more, me me more melancholic. Um, you know, it seems a little bit darker. And I wonder, you know, do they feel like opposites, potentially? Yeah, I, I don't think it gets more opposite than like a fruit punch accord versus like carrot seed and orris and like bitter black tea and all these like moody smells, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's a moody perfume, this indigo smoke. Uh, I think it's really attractive too, honestly, like where, where uh, in love with everything is attractive from the sense of being like the, the fun person at a party. Um, Indigo smoke is like, you know, the edge Lord in the corner that you want to know more about. Right. Uh, you're, you're right. They're foils of each other in the most humorous of ways. And that now that you pointed out, yeah, they are kind of yeah. opposites. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. I can't wait to smell both of these really, really genuinely excited about them both going back to um, in love with everything though. Um, you made me think of another new release, which is a B-52s inspired scent called Rock Lobster by Ricardo Ramos. Um, now... Spray it on your skin. <laughs> it's Rock Lobster. <laughs> That's amazing. I, I think you've told me about that before and I probably made the same awful joke. <laughs> but this has a, um, like an L-net hairspray accord in. Other hairsprays are available. Um, and it, it's a really fun fruity crazy scent it's bonkers it's um i think he said it's like a teenage girl going out for lobster with her dad but you can smell the hairspray and i mean it sounds to say a perfume smells of hairspray sounds awful but it's really not it's a really fun fragrance and it's it's got like lots of twists and turns to it so i find it really quite interesting so that's another one that i had forgotten about would just slip in there um so i'm going to take you to 
my penultimate pick for superbness. Um, Tonka Bodycon, the new Pierre Guillaume. So this oh, is... Oh, no. Long-time viewers of this show know where there, this discussion is going. We are <laughs> uh, very big fans of Pierre Guillaume, uh, so I'm excited to hear what you have to say about this. So it's um, ambery rum, tonka bean, apple honey vanilla, pistachio and benzoin. And I just think it's really nice of Pierre to make a fragrance that contains quite a lot of my favourite notes. Um, my description as to what it smells like, though, is going to be quite short. In the, imagine toffee apples. Now imagine them done in a sexy way. <laughs> That's what this smells like. Sexy toffee apples. <laughs> you're, you're kind of breaking my brain a little bit here. Uh, do you... <laughs> Okay, I, maybe this will be of limited value to those who are not as familiar with the Pierre, Pierre Guillaume line as we are, but out of curiosity, can you compare it to any of their earlier releases? Not really. So there's, um a, again, it smells really golden. There's a lot of these scents coming through at the moment that smell, you know, we, we identified savoury green as a trend. I also think like molten gold is a trend in perfumery at the moment. Um, the ambery rum gives it, uh, yeah, a slightly boozy, almost fruity, um, high pitched sort of quality. Um, and it makes me think of those nights that you know I have never certainly had never, where you've drunk too much spiced rum and you start like to feel the room spin a little bit. Um, I couldn't possibly comment on that, but um, yes, yeah, so there's that and the tonka. It's really sweet. Um, and there is this kind of high pitched vibration about it, um, and I think it, without the apple, it would have been just toothachingly sugary. But the apple just punches through all that and gives you a tartness on which to hang all the sweetness. Which is why I say toffee toffee apples because it feels like you've bitten through. Like okay, so maybe not, not sexy toffee apples, maybe. Eating a toffee apple when you've drunk too much rum, <laughs> that's maybe what it is. <laughs> there can be a, a lasciviousness uh, about that in and of itself. So sure, I, I'm, yeah. I'm buying it. I'll, I'll bite. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you get that sweetness with this fruitiness. Um, and then in the base, there's that kind of lower, um, lower vibrating benzoin that just ties it all back together and the pistachio it's not overly nutty and overly pistachio i don't think but it gives it a grounding uh, and it just stops the rumminess from being you know going to your head far too much and making you totally intoxicated it, it kind of just slows it down again um and there is something quite sexy about it i i don't know that i don't it's like um hedonistic and i think because it is a little bit alcoholic, a little bit, you know, or at least in part alcoholic, in part um, sweet, and then almost in part forbidden fruit of apple. There's that, I don't know, there's a strange interplay go going on that makes you think, well, yeah, what quite is happening here? It's really, um, it's one that I've really enjoyed wearing and it's, it's lasted really well, um, but I don't feel like I've quite, fully understood it yet i feel like there's quite a lot going on and it needs quite a few wares to really get into it and to you know get the true sense of it um but yeah really really nice to see pierre doing something so sumptuous and rich and i think he does things like apple accords really well as well so the punchiness of that apple really delivers um mm. and it smells very much like a green apple this sort of sounds a little concerning for me insofar as it kind of reminds me of some of the qualities that people seem to to praise in something like the, those Killian Gourmand perfumes that are, mm -hmm. um, you know, quite aggressive on the skin, I'd say. Um, mm -hmm. and, but they're, they're best sellers, right? They, they fly off the shelves. Like, is it Love Don't Be Shy and like On, on the Rocks or some Brandy on the Rocks? That, those those uh, Gourmandy bent um Killians. Is this like any of those at all, do you think? Um, I, I could see that comparison being made, actually. Yeah, because of the the ambery rum, I think. Um, yeah, I could see people making that comparison. For me, 
it smells very much like a Pierre though, so it doesn't depart too much from his sort of oeuvre. Um, definitely for me a winter perfume. I think in summer you'll get too much sweetness, but in winter I think it that on a on a like a cold a cold day when you've got a scarf on and you're all bundled up, it's that sort of scent that there's a nice tension to that, um, you know, with the, the cold air and they they play with each other quite nicely. But yeah, it's um it's interesting. I think, you know, the name as well, Tonka Bodycon. Um, the bodycon being the you know the bodycon dresses. Um, I find it really interesting the way that Pierre you know treats femininity in his fragrances. I think there is quite often, you know, a lot of his scents are named around or inspired by women, and I really enjoy that element of his work because to me there's a there's a sort of empowerment in in that and in the way he uses like bodycon like it doesn't feel lascivious it feels empowering somehow and maybe i'm reading too much into that and maybe that's because you know i've met pierre and he's a really lovely chap um i don't know but that's the sort of sense i get it's not it doesn't feel like that you know drooly male gaze it feels like a woman who is empowered rather than you know just kind of simpering which is quite nice. Yeah, no, that's that's incredible. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to smell it, even if it might be sounds like it might be a little too sweet for my normal taste, but I'm gonna try it anyway. You know, yeah, yeah. great. I think you should. Yeah, I think it, yeah, you've got nothing to lose by trying it, which is Certainly. the case with all perfumes, which is how we all get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so your ultimate, your that was your penultimate. What is your ultimate uh, discussion point today? So new brand to me, hadn't smelled these at all. Um, and this fragrance is called Scorpio Rising by the brand Eris. Um, genuinely think this might be the most exciting perfume I've smelled all year. It's so good. Um, and I need to read you the notes list. So it's black and pink pepper, clove, cinnamon, cardamom, immortel, incense, cypriol, cedarwood, guyac wood, saffron, sandalwood, ambroxan, cashmeran, uh, Haitian vetiver, leather, uh, and the concentration twenty five percent. Oh god, it's so good. It's spicy. It's rich. It, it's you know when spices get so concentrated, they start to take on a fruity quality. It's it's got that sort of fruity. Um, it just so satisfying. You know, it's definitely one for people who like spiced scents. Um, it's warm really really rich really multifaceted and it just hums off the skin it it's just wonderful like it, it, it there's a real addictiveness to it there's a kind of um yeah an intoxicating quality like an yeah this um you just want to keep sniffing it because what at first you smell as cardamom, you go back and, oh, it's clove. And then it's like, oh, it's something else. It's something else. It's something else. And it just keeps rolling. Um, it's thoroughly gorgeous. The black pepper in it is, um, it has this real clarity to it. Um, and it smells so full of lift and it's just gorgeous. I'm just so excited by it. Um, and I almost, you know, I want to wear it all the time at the moment, particularly on the cold weather, but I almost am a little bit frightened too because my initial wears have been so positive that I don't want to spoil that. <laughs> so thoroughly gorgeous. And yeah, that's um, Eris, Eris Parfums, which are a new brand to me and I'm going to be diving into the um, the whole range a bit more because they are so, on, on the strength of Scorpio Rising, they are so good. Yeah, so. no, I, I've only tried, I think, I think one of their perfumes before. So yeah, I, I'm curious to check this one out. Um, do you find that it has like a huge body to to it? Does it does it project? Uh, where where on the projection scale does it lie, and how much how how thick of a perfume, if you will, is it? So y yes, it does project. Um, now I started off because the first time I wore it, I was a little bit. Um, you know, nervous of how big it was. So I really sprayed the tiniest amount on and it lasted really well. 
Um, I, in terms of thickness, I, I wouldn't describe it as thick. It's, it's because it's got so much life from the peppers. It's got so much movement that if I say it's like wearing a cloud of bees, <laughs> you know, that doesn't sound like a very nice thing. But actually, if the bees are your friends and you can use them to like jab at people you don't like, you know, if that's your superpower is to be surrounded by a cloud of bees, that's sort of what it feels like. You know, it feels like everything's hovering around you and, you know, it, it gives you an aura. Um, if you want a perfume, if you've got something really difficult to do, you know, if you've got a difficult meeting at work, you've got something where you need to impress people and you want to kind of be be walking in your most empowered self, this is the perfume for you because, wow, does it make you feel like you're 10 feet tall and you've got your armour on and your cloud of bees to help fight your corner. You um, have been knocking it out of the park today with these, with this, <laughs> like, metaphorical figurative language my lord I, okay i'm sold right how could i say no to that experience it sounds great yeah it's really really good and i'm very grateful um to uh to the people that sent me that because it's fab and i am yeah it was one of those like we, we you know when you because we smell so much and a lot you kind of go yeah that's that's nice or that's interesting or that's a good example of this but it's one of those where your heart starts to beat faster and you're like oh hang on this is one of this is one of the real gems. Um, so yeah, very, very positive um early impressions on that. So, I, I just wanted to um, Oh no, go finish. right ahead, sorry. Sorry. So I just wanted to finish by mentioning, you know, we we do specialise in um in niche, obviously, and it's where you know my true excitement lies. But I just wanted to mention another new release, which is a designer, which is Prada's Paradox. Um so this is pear, tangerine, bergamot, orange blossom, jasmine sandback, neroli, vanilla, white musk, amber, and benzoin. Now, ladies of a certain age in the UK will remember our childhoods. I, I, it may well have been the same for America. I, I'm not sure. But when I was about 13, maybe, all girls wore at school was white musk by the body shop. <laughs> and I, yeah, I've still got this, like, nostalgia for white musk i mean paradox is a sweet sugary floral mush of a perfume but the white musk in the bottom really reminds me of my teenage years stinking of white musk <laughs> in a lovely way and i just wanted to I sort of highlight it. Firstly, it's a cool bottle. That is a cool bottle. I really like that. Um, but also, if you've got any, you know, sort of early teenage girls in your life, or even slightly later teenage girls who are wanting to move away from body spray, perhaps into their first perfume, I think people could do a lot worse than buy this for, for them for a Christmas present because it has that youthfulness um, and the white muskiness. You know, if, if you're a bit nostalgic about how you smelt at school and you're buying it for your kids now, I think, yeah, that's it's quite sweet, really. It's quite a sweet little perfume. I it, I, lo I love the range here. Uh, we've gone from so such opposites in, in spectrum today in terms of scent and how we've spoken about scent. So that's that's fantastic. Um, I, I guess right now, I to, to close things out, I wanted to encourage people who are watching uh, whether it's their first time or repeat watchers of Fragrantica Talks, to let us know what sense they are excited about right now. I'd be curious to get my nose on some uh, some listener slash viewer recommendations. Um, and also, I'd like to say, for those who uh, have been watching some of our Fragrantica, Fragrantica Talks videos in, in recent times, uh, do you like what we did today? I, I'm kind of curious because this is sort of our first time just sort of talking ad nauseum about uh, new things that we're excited about. Uh, so, you know, we, we typically kind of theme the episodes a little bit more uh, than than that. So uh, I had a blast doing this. And I think, you know, from what I read in the positive comments about our work, it seems as though people really like when we just sort of are two friends talking in a room about perfume. But um, we also try to, you know, 
put an edge of theme behind what we do more often than not, just to kind of give us a talking point and to, you know, structure the episode. But I had a blast just talking about random things that we're excited about that are new right now or new to us. And so I'd be curious to know if, if everybody who uh, is already a, a follower of what we do, uh, if, if you've enjoyed this as well. So any, any input you can give us is always helpful and we'll take it to heart. So we appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks very much.